Good morning, Truevine. Thank you for joining us today, whether it be in person or online. If you're watching online, go ahead and drop a comment in the chat and say hello to our online host and others worshiping with you online. But also, send the link to the service to a friend or family member and invite them to church. But wherever you are joining us from, let's stand up, get ready, and expect great things from God. Amen, True Vine. Are you ready to worship the Lord in this place? Why don't you could just continue to stand up to your feet? Before we start service, why don't you begin to stir the atmosphere up? God, we want your spirit in this house, God. We need your spirit in this house, Jesus. Just put your hands together and just begin to stir the atmosphere. Begin to stir the atmosphere, God. We're going to allow praise up. We're going to allow worship up today, Lord. Come and move within your people. Have your way, Jesus. Have your way, Jesus. Have your way. We need your spirit, Father. We can't do this without your God. Come on and put your hands together.
us here at True Vine for Sunday morning service. Amen. For those of you who are coming in, it's your first time, we welcome you. Can we give our first time guests a hand clap? Amen, amen. If you are here and it is your first time and you have not received a Connect card, the ushers are coming at this time with a Connect card and a pen for you to fill out entirely. There are three ways to get that back to us. You can simply leave it on your seat. You can drop it off in the offering buckets or you can leave it at our Connect table um, out in the lobby if you'd like to as well. For those of you who are tech savvy and would like to use your phone to fill out that Connect card because we're like, hey, paper's in the past. We can just simply tap your phone to that circle that's on the seat in front of you and it will pull that up digitally for you. We also have an option to text in the Connect card as well. Behind me, the number should be looping on the screen as well. For those of you who are just looking to stay in touch with Truvine and see what we're all about, make sure to fill out that Connect card, but we also have social media services. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, truvine.live, our Facebook page, YouTube, if you happen to miss Sunday and you wanna check out that service, be sure to check in on YouTube because we have those services for you to watch on repeat. Those of you who are filling out that Connect card, whether it's digitally or on that old-fashioned paper, eh, we do have a free gift for you for doing so because we love staying in touch with our members here at Truvine. We're so excited to stay in touch with you and we're excited for you to be with us for the rest of this service. Please welcome the Waddles, Pastor and Sister Waddle. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Feels good to be here, to be home on a Sunday morning. Are you blessed this morning? Amen, amen. We just have a few announcements here today. This Friday is Easter. It's Easter weekend, but this Friday is our service in Spanish. Servicio en Español en total. I don't know if I said that. Servicio. Oh, he's correcting me. Please. So Friday, 7.30 is our Spanish service, our Good Friday service. It will be right here in the sanctuary at 7.30. And then at Saturday at 4.30, it's more casual spirit Sunday attire. Uh, come casual. We're going to have great Easter service. We're going to have great worship. They have a lot of great things planned that day. And then afterwards, about 545, we're all going to go outside and we're going to have jumpers and cotton candy. We have different uh, carnival game shootouts, throwing. We got Aguas Frescas. We're going to have a S Saturday night is going to be the night you want to be here and you want to bring somebody with you on Saturday night. Because if they go to church on Sunday, they're probably going to go to Easter service at their church on Sunday. Saturday is the best time to bring new people to church. Sunday is a great time too, but if they're already going to another church. So you got plenty of options to invite people. Saturday night's going to be a great night. It's going to be about an hour and 15 minute service. And we're going to go outside and have a great time of fellowship and hanging out with everybody that comes that night. Amen. And then Sunday, we have one service on Sunday. That is Easter Sunday. That will be more of a traditional service. On Saturday and Sunday, it is the same worship, the same sermon. So please pick one that works best for you or your guests if you're inviting. But Sunday, we have 10 a.m., one service right here. Sunday at 10 a.m., one service. And that will be a more of a traditional service for you and your family if that's what you choose to do. And then if you would, get your... They don't tell you this very often in church, but can everybody get your cell phone out right now? Everybody get your cell phone out. I, come on, Katie's, come on, come Katie's on. going to throw something up. Let me get out of the way. This is a text message you can send to your friends right now. Just get out your cell phone. If We've you don't already have a, thought of what you need to type. If you don't have a friend, you can borrow one of mine, okay? But I think you're probably Your okay. family, your cousins, whoever you want. Your boss. He, your boss. He knows your he, they yeah, need your boss needs the Lord for sure. Yes, for sure. We want to get you a raise. Let's invite him to church. And if your boss goes to this church, don't text him this. Then they'll, <laughs> but no, get your phones out. Take this down. Text it to two or three fa friends or family members. Invite them out to Easter Sunday, um, to Easter weekend here, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. That's right. We are excited for the great weekend that True Vine's going to have, and we are excited for the rest of today's service. Amen? Please watch this video. There's no video. There's no video. So we're glad to have our children's director for SoCal with us. He's an evangelist. It, and today is, put your hands together, let's welcome our evangelist, Joseph Gomez. He's coming up right now at this time, and he's going to present to you the need of what Save Our Children is for and our Save Our Children offering. So as he's coming, you can stay seated. He's going to present to you the, the need and the cause. Thank you for being with us today. God bless you, True Vine. So great to be with you all today. We are in our Save Our Children campaign, and we've got a couple of things going on with that. Um, we have something that we introduced in our district this year for the very first year, something that is uh, 
going on nationally. It's called Toby's Top Dog. Have, can you raise your hand if you've seen Toby around our district? He's a big dog. Yesterday we couldn't find him. We were literally whistling for him. Toby, come here, Toby, come here, Toby. And we found him. He was in the fellowship hall. But, um, uh, Toby's Top Dog is any one individual child who raises $1,000 or more for Save Our Children will be a Toby Top Dog. And what that means is that that child will get registration way for junior camp, registration way for uh, boys boot camp, and then we will pay for their Esther conference or Prince's conference, depending on the age if it's a, if it's a girl. And uh, they will also get their Bible quizzing waived for next year. We're going to cover that cost. So we want, we want these kids to be honored and to take part in everything that we're doing for children's ministries. Uh, but that's just one incentive to get children to start to raise money so that they can get prepared in having a giving spirit. Uh, and I like it, but I also don't want to get away from the actual theme of the offering. The offering is called Save Our Children. So we're giving the children an opportunity to raise funds and, and do that to be part of it. But it's still our responsibility to save the children. They can't save themselves. Amen? So you ever get in an airplane and uh, they tell you this whole, this whole beautiful speech and we get into an accident and the oxygen mask come down, put your mask on before you put the children's mask on? Uh, it's the same concept. We, we have an obligation. The children can't save themselves. We, we do not believe that an eight-year-old can make a decision for themselves. Uh, and so we want to do everything that we can do to direct them, guide them, and encourage them into the ways of God. Now, right now, in the atmosphere that we're in, the, our children are the number one target to get the church to shut down. You have to understand, the government, they, they, uh, the, the devil, he, he does not want the church to go forward. And he has got a plan. His plan is to attack the weakest link. And the weakest link are always the children. They can't defend themselves. They can't do nothing for themselves. And their minds are the easiest to be transformed and changed and molded to they want it to be. So no longer is the devil really having an emphasis on shutting down the church by just attacking you. Although he still does that. But he's kind of figured out, you know what, if I come after the children... And if I can attack them in 30 years, if I can indoctrinate the children of today in 30 years, there won't be a church. So we need to do everything that we can do. We, we need to draw a, a line in the ground and decide that we're going to preach the apostolic message to our children. We're not just going to send them to a classroom to play, but we're going to minister to our children. So when you send your kids to, to junior camp, you send them to boot camp, to Prince's Conference, these kids are not just learning um, how to, how to sing a, a, a you know hokey pokey song. They're learning apostolic truth because we're in an hour now where these kids need to be indoctrinated. And so uh, we have a great cause. Now, every penny that you, this church will raise for Save Our Children, 50% of that money will go to the United Pentecostal Church International Headquarters, and then from there it will be split up to uh, serve children all over the nation and all over the world. We have an orphanage in Haiti right now that I, I don't know if this has uh, been made public to everyone yet, but we, we have two orphanages in Haiti that the, the gangs have taken over, and we've had to uh, hide our children. They, they took over our orphanage. Uh, the, the gangs took it over. The, the pastor, uh, they tried to kill him and his wife, and they're, they've been in critical condition, but they're doing a lot better now. We have the children hidden in a different place because they're trying to take these kids, kidnap them, and turn them into... Uh, uh, human trafficking victims so we're, we're, we're hiding these children so we need more funds for that because we had a building that was paid off and now we've got to find a new place to put these kids that's a very urgent thing going on and then we also have a, a, a ministry that we help children everywhere there's a church here in section 1 in uh, San Diego that their entire church flooded I mean the, the pastor's residence with the water went up I mean it's, most of you know it's way, way above the windows but the entire children's ministries department, the bungalows they had in the, in the back, completely were flooded. And insurance is not covering that because it's not part of the actual structure. So I reached out to children's ministries and I said, hey, we have these two bungalows that were completely wiped out. We can't, they cannot be used. That's where children's church was, was being held. So uh, children's ministry said, all right, we're going to cut a grant for that church of $10,000 so that we can rebuild the children's ministries for that church. Amen. So that's... That's an effect that we're having here in our district, in your section. So when you give to save our children, you are helping children in, our, in, your, in your church, in your section, in your district, 
all over the nation and all over the world. And so I thank you. I believe in a moment they're going to uh, they're going to have a uh, pastor come up and he's going to do something special here. But thank you for listening to me with all this. Thank you, Brother Gomez. Good morning and God bless you for being here. If you're streaming with us, I'm glad you're utilizing technology. Thank you for worshiping God over this in Old Town Temecula. Pastoral staff, would you come help me? We've done this in the past. They have some cards with just numbers on them, basically 1 through 100. And in the next couple of weeks, I'll say two weeks, if you can just give towards the ministry. Again, we come to you four times a year to support things outside our church. I like to call this one for the kids. And the money goes to the kids' ministry. Brother Gomez shared with us where it goes in some areas that we help fund. But if you could get this in in the next two weeks, and when you give it, just earmark it because we categorize the giving to be responsible. And if you want to market SOC or just market kids offering, we'll know, and we will make sure that that gets to the ministry. And again, here, Brother Savage has the true kids. Okay, so we've got these set aside. These are cards one through, one through 20. So if you have anybody in true kids and want to teach them how to give, Brother Renee has 21 through 50. Brother Tony has 51 through 75. And overachievers, 76 through 100. So why don't you come and grab a card, amen, and just in the next couple weeks, if you can give to the kids, hey, we're going to do our part. We're never going to be a no-show, but we want to show the world that we are blessed. Again, if you have true kids, Brother Savage, is, that's not for adults. It's for the kids, okay? 75 to 100. Also in our church center app, it says SOC if you want to give, save our children. You want to give digitally. Amen. Thank you, church. We're going to do our part no matter what. God's blessed us. Amen. Brand new carpet. This place is amazing with amazing people. And we're not selfish. We're not stingy. And God gives us more. And we give more. True kids, 21 through 25. Or 50, 50 to 75, 75 to 100. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, True Vine. If you're streaming on live with us on our app, you can give to SOC, the initials, which represents Save Our Children. Amen. If you could honor this pledge in the next two weeks, then we will make sure all of that goes to the ministry, help support and help fund things that go beyond us. And I think if we're just a church of keeping, 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 that's what the Dead Sea does. It doesn't give away, and it becomes stagnant, mildew, moss, mosquitoes, so God's resources flow through us, and when it gets to the kingdom, God keeps giving you more resources. And the more he gives you, the more we keep and the more we give. So it's a win-win situation. Again, I just want to say thank you, thank you as a pastor for supporting outside the local assembly. Again, this is beyond our tithe and offerings. This is what I would call sacrificial giving. So I'm not taking my tithe to make this a pledge. I'm sacrificially giving. We don't ask you to do that very often. But that's not normal in America, but we believe in giving to the things of God. Praise God. Thank you, gentlemen, for helping me. Amen. The ushers are coming at this time. If you've come and to give your regular tithe and offerings, there's a giving kiosk in the back. Again, on the app, you could give to SOC. You can give on the app. The cool thing about the app, there when you go to giving, you can check my giving, and you can pull your own financial giving report if you ever want to check how much have I given. I can't remember, did I give last week? I got paid. I lost track of time. It just helps you categorize your faithfulness. And so that is also on the app. And then, of course, a lot of you, over 75% of you give digitally. So there's not a lot of people that give checks and cash, but we're, we're open, and it all goes to the kingdom. So as a pastor, let me just say, I don't take it for granted. I say thank you. Because your worship to God 
every week is the commute, the job, the commute home, the pay, and then you contribute with your talent. I understand. I, I used to do the commute to National City every day, try to carve out a church and find time to study and counsel and grow a church. I understand what goes into live in Southern California, so I just want to say thank you for trusting God and thank you for being faithful. Amen. Let me pray for us. Can you stand if, if you're able to? Side note, my wife is recovering good. Some of you probably heard we were hiking Rio de Janeiro. Woo, honeymoon capital of the world, but we didn't have that experience in Rio. And she was coming down the mountain, and she didn't trip. Her legs just gave out. She thinks she was exhausted. She said they were starting to hurt, and she thought she could make it. And we were from finishing the hiking trail. I'm going to say we were from the freeway here to Old Town Front Street. I mean, we could see the little hut in the cafe where we started, but her legs said no more. And all I heard was this ruffle on the ground. I heard, uh, what in the world? Would you get up? I can't get up. Oh, my. And then we kind of all got scared, right? We were kind of teasing her a little bit. And then we realized, hey, this is for real, right? We shouldn't be laughing about stuff like this. That's not nice. And she reminded us that's not nice also. <laughs> oh, 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 did she remind us? Seven more days. Anyway, back, back. <laughs> meanwhile, back in Temecula. Anyway, she's home. She's, uh, we have a walker. We have a wheelchair. We have crutches. And we have a shower chair. Now, I never lived in a home with all that before. Uh, but it's working. And so she's shuffling around. She will be here next Sunday. Even if we have to carry her in like we did down the mountain, Sister Durant will be here regardless. But she's mending her sister's baby. I mean, her sister is watching her this morning and keeping an eye on her. And they're streaming. She's already texted me trying to tell me what to do. And she can't even walk, but she, she can still text. And she can't even talk, everybody. So um, I wouldn't say my life's great, but it's not really that great. Uh, we're expecting her. So she apologizes for her absence, and she says she loves everybody and that she will do her best to hug everybody's neck next week. But you might have to come to her to get your neck hugged and to get a high five. So anyway, thank you for your prayers. Let me pray for this. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all that you do. We are faithful. We are good stewards, God. We resource what you give us. And I pray that you'd bless the gift and the giver our SOC for our kids, our tithe and offerings. I pray that you'd rebuke the devourer, God. I pray against any darkness that would come upon anybody of this church, illness, depression, anxiety. We come against that, Lord, with our obedience to the word of God. Anoint those that are watching online. Anoint this house. I trust you, and we believe you, and we say thank you in Jesus' name. Someone shout, thank you, Lord. Amen. God bless you. Greet someone the next to you. The kiosks are in the back. Ushers are coming. Again, if you give online, if you give on the app, I say thank you, thank you, thank you.
would you just respond to his presence in this place? God is here to move in this house today. Why don't you just respond in this house? Jesus, I give you my burdens. I give you my high things. I give you the hard things in this life, Jesus. You can have it all today, God. You can have it today, Father.
you lift your hands to heaven for just a little while? I wonder if for the next few moments we can just minister to the Lord. I wonder if we can just surrender all to God right now. Something very significant happens when we come into the presence of God and we put aside our needs and our wants and our desires and we just focus on who He is. I wonder if just for the next maybe 30 seconds we can put all of our situations aside and just magnify Him for who He is. Not for what He's going to give us, but for who He is. God, you are a great God. You are a wonderful God. Lord, let our praise and our worship be a sweet sound into your ear today, God. Let us come into your throne room, Lord God, lifting up holy praise and worship unto you, Lord God. Let us be a sweet fragrance, Lord God, to you, Lord. Oh, we surrender ourselves, God, and we lift up your name, God. You are holy. You are mighty. We exalt you, God. Praise the Lord. How many of you are excited to be in the house of the Lord today? God is so good. Hallelujah. It is such an honor to be in True Vine today. I, uh, I'm attracted to excellence. And uh, it's because it's one of my weakness. <laughs> so I'm attracted to it. <laughs> and this church, it just, it has a level of excellence that is uncomparable to anything else. It is fantastic, and it's uh, obviously because of the fantastic leadership. I give honor to Brother Durant, Brother Waddle, and Sister Waddle, Sister Durant, for this excellence that they do and all that they do. Um, it's just an honor to come and stand at this pulpit. You guys have the greatest preachers in all of Pentecost here in this church. Amen. <laughs> And uh, I don't take it lightly. Thank you so much for the great honor of the invitation. I want to give honor to my wife. She is the most beautiful woman who's ever existed. Your wife is in second place. Mine's in first place. <laughs> she's been traveling with me, and she's a little, uh, a little occupied with three of my four kids. I, I, we have a, an allergic reaction that happens so often. She gets around me, and then she kind of... An allergic reaction happens where she gets this belly and the child comes out of there. So um, that allergic reaction has caused for us to take preventative measures. So we're, we're making sure we don't have no more reactions. But those four children are the, uh, are the preventative measures. So she's, she's attending to three. I've got one with me. Just keep our family in your prayers. And um, I feel I have something I'm going to minister to this church today. If you would open your Bible to... Exodus chapter 20, we'll start with verse 1 through verse 6, and it says, And God spake all these, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images, or any likeness, or anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Would you lift your hands to heaven? 
And would you ask God to speak to you today? Lord God, I come before you one more time, God. I pray, Lord, that you would anoint me to deliver this word unto your people, God. And that you would anoint your people, Lord God, to receive this word, Lord God. And that it would be a transformative word in their lives, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that you would elevate our faith, Lord God, to receive, Lord God, and to walk into the newness and the fullness that you have for us today. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we thank you, Lord. Amen. Before you take your seat, would you tell the person next to you that they are absolutely beautiful? This morning, I want to preach to you today or minister to you. Uh, the choice is yours. The choice is yours. And uh, I want to talk to you about this, our opening scripture here. It, it sounds like it would be unfair that God would punish the children for the iniquities and the sins of the fathers unto the third and the fourth generation. And that's exactly what I want to talk to you uh, today about. I mean, the, the subject really is breaking generational curses. And so when we read this opening scripture here, we see that God is going to visit the sins of the fathers unto the children unto the third and the fourth generation. And it would sound like it's something that would be highly unfair and, and, and just say, hey, God, that sounds a little mean, a little cruel. What, what do the kids have to do with, with my decisions? And it's not that God is saying I'm going to make the children pay for your exact sin, but the thing is that the effect of sin is naturally passed down from generation to generation. So uh, let me just give you a little example here. I, I am the oldest of 13. Um, <laughs> now, my parents had two together, and then they split up and had a bunch individually. And, and my dad, my mom only has four. My dad, he's, he's a real Mexican. <laughs> So it's a whole different thing there, right? But uh, my my parents, my 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 parents, when when they were young, they they had me and, and my brother, my mother and my father. They grew up in an apostolic home, but they allowed for an offense to come in and cause them to make a decision that had an impact on our family. I am the only one in my entire family that is still serving the Lord. And it wasn't that I grew up serving the Lord because my parents backslid and it wasn't until I was 18 years old that I came back into this. But I have my brother who is clo uh, the closest to me. He's uh, in age. He is 18 months younger than me. My brother has followed into the footsteps of the decisions that my mother and my father had made when we were children. My mother and my father, they, they got into selling drugs and then they got into s using the drugs that they were selling. And and then they ended up getting caught, and my brother and I, we ended up in foster cares and uh, different foster homes and into a whole system. And, and then uh, we ended up in the custody of our grandparents for some time. They were missionaries, and, and they gave up their post to come and take uh, custody of us. And then when my mother got out of prison, she said, hey, I'm, I, she fought to get custody of us, and she got it. She got custody of us, but she hated God because of everything that she went through and the decisions that she made to leave the church and she still had that bitterness inside of her and so she took us out of church and now I'm just a you know just I was eight years six years old by the time that my mother got custody of us again and, and we lived a cycle of chaos and it became very normal and and our house became the the place where it was it was the connection place you would think that she would have given up on old habits but you know unfortunately she didn't and Thank God now she's, she's not living for God yet, but she just went to ladies' conference. <laughs> so thank you for having it in San Diego. And uh, there's some things that happened, but my brother, who's 18 years younger, uh, 18 months younger than me, he has made a decision to follow the steps, uh, the natural effects of sin that were passed down from my mother and my father. And my brother today, he is a drug addict and an alcoholic. And he, he's a hard worker. They taught us how to work hard, but he can't really keep a job. And he gets a job, and he works in construction, and he, he works hard, and, and he does good, and then he, he, he needs to get that fix in, and, and he does that. And unfortunately, I've, I've done everything that I can to try to convince him to live for God, but, but he, something was passed down to him that was anti-God. And so now he's got two children and one on the way. And the last time I went to go visit him, and I, I went to his house. His entire house smelled like marijuana. And, and I told him, okay, I, you know, this, this isn't good for your kids. And, and he got upset with me because they, he had pipes and bongs and all kinds of drug paraphernalia all over the house. And, and the kids were there, and the kids, their clothes smelled like marijuana. And, and, 
my nieces and nephews are growing up in an environment that I grew up because the effects of sin were naturally passed down. You see, it's not that God is going to punish your children because of your sins, but if you don't get a hold of them, you are going to let your children inherit something. And we have to make a decision. The choice is yours. When a father lives a sinful lifestyle, usually the children will follow the steps of the father. In the Mexican culture, I, I'm kind of messed up, y'all. It's really messed up. I grew up in San Diego, and I thought I was 100% Mexicano, Chicano all the way. And uh, I did that 23andMe thing, and I'm only 1.6% uh, Mexican. <laughs> I'm having an identity crisis. It said I'm 64% Italian, and I was like, you're, forget about it. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but I'm having a crisis here. But culturally, I identify as Mexican, all right? Uh, I, I prefer menudo and media over lasagna. <laughs> I don't know if it's SoCal or Mexican, but it's just what, I, what it is. But, uh, uh, you know, I... Uh, uh, in the Mexican culture that I grew up in, I, I realized that the majority of young men will have their first drink of beer at a family event. By the time that you are 16 years old, if you were Mexican and didn't grow up in the church, most likely you had your first beer and it, it was at a family event. Now don't say amen, those of you who are guilty. But it's just... Part of what's being passed down. There is an ancient paraphrase that, that uh, kind of backs up this scripture. And it says, ungodly fathers create rebellious children. And so I, I just want you to understand that the decisions that you make today, not only do they have an impact on your individual life, but they have an impact on the generations that are following behind you. And I want you to realize that God thinks generationally. He thinks generational. Now, what if you could look into your future? What if you can look 10 years ahead from this very moment right now? If you were to make not one single change in your life, what would, it, what would your life look like in 10 years? Now, that's one question, but what would your children's life look like in 10 years if you do not make any single changes in your life? You see, a lot of times uh, you can look into the future by looking at the past. Now, when we're in God, we don't really have a past. We only have a future. But if you don't come to God and make some changes, then, then you're kind of stuck in the past. You see, uh, the, the miracle is what God will do for you. But then the power of the Holy Ghost will give you the strength to really live without going back to the past. You see, it's the blood of Jesus that will forgive you, that will set you free. But it's the Holy Ghost that will start to make change in your life so that you don't go back to those old habits. Because how many of you know that sin is easy to fall back into? I mean, if I can be very frank, sin, is, sin feels good. Sin is pleasing the body. It's pleasing the flesh. It's whatever the flesh wants. And, and, and we don't hear it too much anymore that we have to crucify the flesh and we have to deny ourselves and pick up our cross. And, and we kind of just, uh, my generation just wants the easy preaching. We just want the blessings. You know, I, I'm an evangelist. If I preach miracle signs and wonders every time, I get more invitations. But when I preach stuff like this, uh, I just, I don't get callbacks anymore. I don't know what's going on. So, uh, but just bear with me now. God, he thinks generationally. He thinks generationally, and so a lot of times, if, if you want to look at the future, you can look at the past, and you can see where you've gotten, whether good or bad, because of decisions that you have made. God thinks generationally. In our opening scripture, uh, we see that God will visit the sins of the, uh, of the fathers to the children and to the third and the fourth generation, uh, because God thinks generationally. Uh, there, there, there are more than 27 books in the Bible, but in 27 of the books in the Bible, there is reference or mention of some sort of generation or genealogy or children's children or, or some kind of uh, inheritance of some form. There's a, a mention of generations because God thinks 
generationally. There's over 937 scriptures, because there was 938 when I did my word search. <laughs> so there was over, it just sounds better as a preacher talk, right? There was over 937 scriptures that talk about generations in some way, some facet, some form, because God thinks generationally. And if you read through the scripture and you study the scripture, you're going to quickly see that the decisions that you make have generational impacts. Because God thinks generationally. As a matter of fact, the, the, the first book of the New Testament, it wasn't written in this order. It was actually the last of the Gospels that was written. But the first book of the New Testament is the book of Matthew. And it begins with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Because God thinks generationally. Right, right. God thinks generationally. And when you read the scriptures, you read that the, uh, you see the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because God thinks generationally. Amen. And you see, everything that you do, every decision that you make, there is a generational impact that it's had. Now, uh, there's a story in the Bible, in, in the book of Mark, and uh, it's a very, very interesting story. Many of us have heard it many times. If we go to Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, verse 17, it's a really good story about a, a young, rich ruler. And I, I like to think that he was probably as good-looking as me. Um, I don't know. Maybe he was as good-looking as Pastor Mark, but he, it, it, I don't know. But he, he had it going on. So it says, And when, when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running, and he kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but that one that is God. And then Jesus continues, thou knowing, uh, knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery. See, he's coming and saying, uh, what do I got to do to make it to heaven? You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and thy mother. And then this, uh, this young, good-looking, rich ruler, he says, all these things I have kept, I've observed from my youth. I've, you know what he's saying? I'm a good person. I'm a good person, Jesus, so, so what do I got to do? How much do I got to pay to make it to heaven? I'm a good person. Because he thought he can pay his way in. And, and, and it's interesting here the way that Jesus responds to him. Because the Bible says, then Jesus beholding him, loved him. Con mucho cariño le dijo. With a lot of love he said to him, one thing thou lackest, go thy way. Sell whatsoever thou hast, give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up thy cross, and follow me. He made a decision that day, because the choice was his. In the next scripture, it says, And he was sad at the same, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. He made a decision that day. Day that had a generational impact because then in the next scripture uh, Jesus begins to use this young rich ruler as an example of what not to be but if you think about it he made a decision consider the story of this young rich ruler he had it all going on he, 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 he was asking hey I'm a good person what do I need to do to inherit salvation to inherit eternal life what what do i need how much do i need to pay and he says hey look there's nothing you can do to pay to make it but just forget about who you are deny yourself pick up the cross and follow me jesus gave him an invitation that's very familiar follow me if, if, you, if you go through the scriptures and you start to see every time that Jesus said, follow me, and someone followed him, we know that individual's name. The tax collector followed Jesus, and we know his name. The doctor followed Jesus, and we know his name. The fisher, he followed Jesus, and we know his name. Because they had a choice to make, and they made the decision to follow Jesus. But this young, rich ruler made a decision to not follow Jesus, to continue in his way, and he's become an example of what not to be. Consider today the decisions that you make. 
Consider today the impact that will be made on your family. Imagine this man had a call of God on his life and an invitation to follow Jesus. I am certain had he said, yes, Jesus, I will sell everything that I have and I will follow you. We would know him by name, but we do not know him by name. Now, I say that to you because many of us have had authority figures in our life who have made decisions that have had generational impacts in our lives. We, we just have. Many of us, we've, we've had to go through some struggles because, uh, you know, mama and daddy just didn't have it all figured out. They tried their best, and we all love our parents, right? They tried the best, but they just didn't have it all figured out. There's some of you here who are apostolic generationally. You've been in this because someone made a decision. Someone had to make a decision. So, you know, the thing is that many of us have fallen into generational patterns because of decisions that were laid out before us that we just kind of fell into. I'm going to pick on, on my culture, not my DNA for a minute, okay? Is that all right? Because uh, culturally, I'm Mexican. You can't take that away from me, right? And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm trying to be careful here. <laughs> you know, uh, us, us, um, us Latinos, and not, not even just the Mexicans, but even, I mean, even the Puerto Ricans, the Cubans, the Brazilians, everything, we, we're, we're spicy. <laughs> Tenemos sabor, hay mucho sazón. You know, we've got something to us, you know. Everyone likes our food, you know what I'm saying? We, we got something, you know? <laughs> so um, it, it's not only in our food that there's spice, though. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're married to a Mexican, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and yours is half Mexican, but I'm pretty sure she's got some salsa in there. You know? <laughs> so, uh, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? You know, just... Uh, some jalapenos, man. That, that, that chile got into the attitude. <laughs> you don't mess with the Mexican mama, right? And, uh, you know, just culturally, there, there's some things. Now, now, we're not perfect. You know, the, the Hispanics, we're not perfect. You know, we, we might look perfect. Everyone wants to look like us, but, but, but we're not perfect, okay? Um, we, we got some things that are just messed up. You know, uh, you know where I learned how to say my first lie? Let me tell you where I learned it. My mom had a, a cousin who she, uh, she, they were frenemies. You know, you know that's kind of common in the Mexican culture. <laughs> it's a chismosa culture. It's a, it's a, it's a whole thing. And uh, I, I, it might be in every culture, but I can only pick on mine, right? <laughs> so uh, so uh, she, she had this frenemy cousin of hers, and uh, they, they just always were, we're at each other's throat with who's better than each other. You know what I'm talking about? So they always had to one-up each other, and they had this whole thing. And, and there would be times that my mom just didn't want to talk to her cousin. And, and you know, I'm, I'm older than I look because I grew up with the landline. <laughs> okay? So there, we, didn't, we didn't have cell phones back in those times. I'm, I'm a millennial. I'm the good millennial, the one that knows how to work, okay? <laughs> Not the one living in your house. <laughs> there's, there's, they should have separated. Anyhow, uh, so, you know, uh, caller ID was, was, you had to have money to have caller ID. They charged extra for it. And uh, when the phone would ring, we would, we would answer the phone, and she would say, who is it? And so I'll be like, it's Mele. Oh, you don't know her. It's all right. <laughs> and uh, she would say, tell her I'm not here. Where did I learn how to lie? It seems innocent. I don't want to talk to her. Tell her I'm not here. And so I remember the first time that I got beat up for my mom really good. My mom said she's not here. <laughs> man, I'll tell you what, those chanclas, man. <laughs> Bam! 
and she, I just see this roaring lion coming to beat me up. It's just, whoo. But I learned how to lie at home. The first lie came at home. And if you ever tell, if I ever told my mom back then, you know, mom, you, you, you're teaching me how to lie. Man, I would have got that salsa. Bam! It's just part of the culture. And there were just little things like that that, that would be done that were shaping my identity of who I was going to become. So right there, as, a, as, as just a 10-year-old kid, I was learning, if, if there's someone that I don't want to talk to or something that I don't want to be around or a consequence that I don't want to pay, I can lie my way out of it. Because that's what I learned at home. And you see, uh, every decision that you make has an impact. Uh, don't raise your hand, but have you ever heard or have you even said it? Te portas igual que tu papá. How do you say it in English? You, you're just like your father. Have you ever heard it? Have you ever said it? Now, husbands, don't look at your wife and look straight at me. Okay? I know all of you love your mother-in-law. You, you, you know, it's like, uh, it's, if, if, if it gets too hot, you want to go to your mother-in-law's house because there's nothing colder than a mother-in-law's love. <laughs> Like we all love our, I love, I got the best mother-in-law ever. That doesn't apply to her. But we all love our mother-in-laws. But, but you know, you ever kind of start to get closer to your mother-in-law, and, and, you, and you start to see how sometimes your wife, she's got a little bit of that, uh, a little bit of that mother-in-law's attitude. You know what I'm talking about? Look at me, husbands. Don't look at your wife. And you've ever thought to yourself, or thought, you know, or, or God forbid you said this, you, you know, you act a whole lot like your mom. Please don't ever say that to her. <laughs> don't ever compare your wife to her mom, okay? Just don't do it. And don't compare her food to your mother-in-law, okay? Your wife cooks better than your mother-in-law, okay? Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but just don't do it, you know. But you ever see how there's some things there? Uh, you know, husband, m mama, daddy, have you ever noticed when your children... You know, it's, it's just such a, a nasty reality check when, when they're, they do things that we do that we don't really like about ourselves. You know, most of the times that, that, that thing that you really dislike that your child does, you want to know where they learned it. And you know why it bothers you so much? Because it's a reflection of who you are. It's a reflection of who you are. And so uh, it's a tragedy when we can identify there are some generational things in my life that I need to stop to do, but we don't, and we can see it happening in the generations that are coming. Because we are all a product of somebody. In Galatians, Paul writes to the church of Galatians, he says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever you sow it, you shall reap. My friend, that goes in the good and in the bad. You have to understand that you are reaping something into the generation that is coming behind you. Every decision that you make, those kids that are behind you, those children, those grandchildren, those nieces, those nephews, those cousins, everyone in your surrounding is being influenced by the decisions that you're making on a daily, uh, on a daily, uh, on, a, on a daily, day, on the daily. <laughs> That's where I'm trying to get to. <laughs> the decisions you're making on the daily, they're having an impact on them. And we all become product of someone. You see, when you begin to sow that anger that you haven't got a hold of, when you begin to sow that, those, that, those little white lies that you haven't got a hold of, when, when you begin to sow that attitude that you haven't got a hold of, when, when you begin to sow that, that lack of submission to spiritual authority, hello somebody, that you haven't got a hold of, you, you begin to do stuff and, and you, are, you have to understand that we are all a product of somebody and your children are going to be a product of you. Now, my parents, they backslid because of an offense. And uh, if I was going to judge the situation, they had, they had reason to be offended. Okay? I, I, I don't like the term church hurt. I think it's a very dumb term. 
because uh, there's hurt everywhere. Some of y'all get hurt with Walmart when they raise the rates, but you still go to Walmart. Some of y'all dress like a certain way at Walmart that hurts me. And uh, some of us are hurt with Target, but we still go there, <laughs> right? Yeah. But when it comes to the church, we, we want to have this church hurt as an excuse to n not face reality. Right. But right. church hurt caused my parents to backslide. Uh, there was some hurts there. There was some, some, some bitterness that came. And so my parents, they backslid. They let, and, and, you know, when you backslide, you don't, you, you don't, no one makes an intentional decision. I know what I'm going to backslide today. <laughs> it never starts like that. It always starts like, you know what, that church, I am, I'm not going to go there anymore. And, 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 and it just, decisions start to happen. Let me tell you something, church. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone here, but if the shoe fits, just wear it. And, and Pastor, I apologize if I offend anyone, but God didn't call you to be a church hopper. Okay? If you get offended at, at whatever's going on here at the church, it, the solution is not to hop to a different church. God didn't call you to be a church hopper. He called you to get planted into the kingdom of God. And when you get planted, you start to grow roots. And, and you know what happens when you cut a tree from the roots is the tree is going to die. And if you, don't get, if, you don't plant the, if you don't plant the tree, the tree is not going to get roots. God didn't call you to be a church hopper. You see, but my parents, they backslid because of an offense that came. And that bitterness came. And you know... I grew up hearing nothing but bad about the church. They only want your money. They're going to use you. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. And so when it came to a time that I really needed God, I didn't run to God. Because my image of God was the church that my mother spoke ill of. And let me just put this into perspective here. There, there, there have been parents that I have, have had the... Uh, opportunity, I wouldn't call it a privilege, I'll say it a disprivilege, to, to talk to because they're like, I can't, uh, I don't know what to do with my children. They're teenagers now and, and, and they, do, they don't listen to their pastor, they don't listen to, to their youth pastor, they don't do anything, they, there's all this nonsense that's going on and I don't know what to do anymore. Uh, and, and, and it's always a simple question, okay, why don't they listen to their pastor? What have you said in your home to talk against the man of God in your life that your children have no respect for him now. You see, what you need to do, mama and daddy, is, and I've told this to you, parents, what you need to do is you need to call your pastor in front of your children and say, Pastor, I need to repent and apologize to you because I spoke against you when I shouldn't have. And these children of mine, they've become a product of that. I, I don't know why I got into that. I don't know. I, I kind of got off my, uh, what, my, my track there. But I just thought I needed to tell somebody the decisions that you're making today will have a generational impact. And, and when God gave me this message, he told me that, Curses, they come in three forms, environmental, spiritual, and physical. And he said, when you have, whenever you go preach this somewhere, uh, you're, you're going to tell my people and I'm going to do something. We're going to break curses in all three realms. Okay? Now, now we're going to break them in all three realms. Right? So there are some environmental generational curses that have come. Some of you, your, your, your decision making has been impacted by the environment you grew up in. And, and, and we need to break some of those things. Some of us, uh, we, we've got some spiritual things that are there. There's some people uh, that, that were, were grown up in some witchcraft environments. And there's I mean, just all kinds of stuff that happens. There's, there's just spiritual things that go on. Okay, And then there's genetic. Have you ever gone to a new doctor for the first time? You ever gone to a new doctor for the first time? They give you an intake form, and on the intake form, they, they, they ask you, in your family, is there a history, and there's a list of infirmities and diseases that are in there, yeah. right? Yeah. Because even medical science believes in this. They just call it uh, genes, but I call it a curse. Yeah. And when God was giving me this message, he told me, when you preach this message, we are going to break generational curses. And I've come to tell you that if there is cancer that has been plaguing your family, we're going to break that today. If there's diabetes that's been plaguing your family or high blood pressure or cholesterol issues or whatever it is, if there's uh, depressions and anxieties and, and spiritual weaknesses, or we're, we're going to break some things today, but it doesn't happen all by itself doesn't happen all by itself 
You see, we believe that we, uh, that we must be born in the water and in the spirit in order to be born again. Right? We, we don't believe and teach that I can just raise my hands and accept salvation. I'm going to make it to heaven. We don't believe that. Amen? We believe that in order to be saved, we must first repent. And then be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is something that we doctrinally believe. And we don't believe that we can just say, oh, all right, I'm saved. We, that's, that's not what we believe. Likewise, when it comes to breaking generational curses, this is something that, look, it cannot be broken by just going to a three-step or five-step program. Right. A generational comes through the bloodline, and the only way to break it is through the blood. And if you're going to break a curse, you've got to apply the blood of Jesus Christ. And let me just, let me just come here to a close here. The Bible says that, that that person that would hang to by the tree would be cursed. And the Bible says that Jesus became cursed to break the curse of the law. And when he became a curse, I believe he broke every curse. And if we're going to break some generational curses in our life today, we need to apply the blood of Jesus Christ over some things that we identify have been curses in our lives now let me tell you like this when Jesus got on the cross he got on the cross and he got on the cross to become cursed for us to break every curse and the last thing that he said the Bible says he said it is finished it is finished now Dr. James Hughes, he's, he's a really smart guy, and he did a lot of research and study on this, and I'm citing him, okay? I can't take credit for it. I wish I could, because this is good. <laughs> but he did a lot of study, a lot of research, and the exact word that Jesus used when he was on that cross, when he said, it is finished, and he gave up the ghost, the exact word that he used was testeslati. And the word testeslati, it, it, it had a, a, a plethora of, of meanings, but it kind of all meant the same thing. It was used in commerce when a debt was paid in full. It was used in projects when the project was complete. But it was also used in times of battle and in times of war and also used in sports. But they wouldn't say testeslati just when the war was over or when the battle was finished. They wouldn't say testeslati just when the race was done. But only the victor would say testeslati. So when Jesus was on that cross, he was looking at the plague of sin on your life. And at every generational curse that has tried to follow you and try to keep you down and try to keep you from the promises of God in your life. And I believe that he was speaking to the times and he was speaking to the future. When he got on that cross, he said, it is finished. Devil, I won. Devil, the race is over. I've already won. You have been defeated. We need to break some things today. But listen, we can't just say, all right, I believe it's over. But there are some things that we need to break. A lot of those generational curses, they've affected the way that we operate. Our speech, our attitude. And the only way to break some of these curses is to bring them to an altar. And say, God, let this curse die at this altar. I plead the blood of Jesus over this. God, let it die at this altar. I don't want this curse to continue. So I want to make an altar call today. If there are some things that you can identify as generational curses that are in your environment, in your family lifestyle, that you don't want your family to inherit, I want you to come to this altar. If there are some generational curses that are in the, the genetics of your family, some, some infirmities that are just been passed down, I want to tell you right now under the anointing of the Holy Ghost that today in this altar, your children will not get the diabetes that your mother got or your daddy got. Cancer is not going to flow in your lineage anymore. We're going to cancel that today in the name of Jesus.
Now, if you're facing some kind of infirmity in your body, some kind of affliction that's generational, I want you to come. I believe a miracle is going to happen today. And not only is it going to cancel it from coming to the future, but we're going to have victory over it today. If you're a husband or a wife and you've got children, if you're just a mother or a daddy, I want you to come to this altar today praying that we're going to break some curses, that your children won't have to face the battles that you had to face. Come on. So I think in order for us to be effective, I think what we need to do here is just spend some time talking to God and presenting to him the curse. Now, he paid the price to break every curse. Let's not let that be in vain. Amen. So would you lift your hands to heaven right there for just a moment? And would you begin to ask God to come into your situation, into your life right now? Lord God, I come before you. I ask, Lord God, that you would take my life and my family, Lord God, into your hands right now. I pray, God, that, that you would take the curses that are in my life, Lord, and that you would bring them into your throne room right now, Lord God, that you would put them on an altar, God, and that you would kill them here today, God, and that your blood would cover them, Lord God, that I might walk in victory here today. Come on, church, begin to talk to God in just a moment. I'm going to release a word of faith, and we're going to break every curse, and we're going to leave victorious. But we're going to pray victory and blessing over your family, over your children and your children's children. Oh, the curse is not going to be there, but I declare blessings will be there. I declare anointing will be there. I declare favor will be there. Right now, by the power and the authority of the written word of God and the power and the authority that is in the name of Jesus we surrender every generational curse and we break it right now by the blood of Jesus Christ right now by the power and the authority that's in the name of Jesus I declare blessings over you and your family I declare favor over you and your family I declare healing over you and your family in the mighty name of Jesus
connect with you, pray with you, and be here with you, strengthening your relationship with Jesus Christ. Whether that be through a Bible study, baptism in Jesus' name, or striving to receive the infilling of the Spirit. We want to connect with you, see the amazing things that God is doing and is going to do in your life. Visit us at truevine.live and become a part of what God is doing at Truevine, what He's going to continue to do in your life.